Hello, my name is Stephen Kilgore, and I'm the managing editor of Feeding Grain and the host of the Feeding Grain podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today as we dive deep into the issues affecting the feed manufacturing, grain handling, and allied industries. Today's episode is brought to you by the bin whip from Numat Systems. The powerful dual impact bin whip removes the toughest buildup and blockages in industrial storage silos without the hazardous silo entry. Learn more today at binwhip.com. Today, we're talking grain bin safety. It's a perfect time of year for that. Fall is coming around the corner and, well, we're going to be moving a lot of grain. So that was a good time for a little refresher. Joining me today is John Lee. He's the Director of Safety and Health at the Grain and Feed Association of Illinois. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining me today, John. Would you mind just uh, telling me who you are and tell your background in the industry? Yeah, my name is uh, John Lee and I work for the Grain and Feed Association of Illinois. My title there is Director of Safety, Health and Environmental Services. And I've been doing it about 25 years I've been in safety world for about 29 years, I guess. Very cool. Well, I know you from the Grain Handling Safety Coalition. So you must do work throughout the entire industry. Oh, I do. All over. I was just at a oh a FFA Winnebago Boone County Farm Bureau meeting for some FFA kids last week. And then the week before that, I was at the Henderson County Farm Bureau meeting for kids. Well, that's great because let's face it, safety is something that should be drilled into people as early as possible. Oh, it is. Yeah, start early. I'm up in southern Wisconsin. We're getting pretty close to harvest now. And so we thought we'd go over some grain bin entry safety tips. Ideally, no one ever goes in the bin, but we all kind of know that's not a realistic. It's not realistic for some situations. So make sure that it's as safe as possible. What are some of things that people should do before they enter a grain bin? What are some of the safety precautions they should take? Back up to the beginning of it, grain bin safety starts right now. As you fill the bins, almost all grain entrapments are because of out of condition grain or a lot of soybean pods, but you can't do much about the pods. You got to dry your grain down to the moisture you want. You got to check the bins. You've got to core the bins after harvest so you get all the fines out of the middle. So that's step one, keeping the grain in good condition. Grain entrapment really happens when the grain is in good condition and flowing out of the bins like normal. The main thing to do is you got to have at least two people. You're talking on the commercial side of things, right? Yeah, though we do have some farm listeners and readers. So in the commercial industry, you have to have an entrant and an observer. That's a requirement. And the observer is a full-time job. The observer has to stay there and watch entrant the whole time. And if the observer has to leave, the entrant has to come out. That'd be step one is never work alone. Actually, that'd be step two, I guess, after a condition. And then never enter a bin that could flow while you're in there. Flow through the unloading equipment or flow from a grain slide or a unexpected movement of some sort. But commercially, they got to fill out a bin entry permit, got to be signed off by the entrant, the observer, and the entry supervisor. And then you got to have the observer and the entrant trained in all the hazards, bridging, hung up grain, hazards of flowing grain, condition issues. It can change from the morning to the afternoon. As you pull grain out, pyramids can form or a bridge could form. You're right. On the commercial side, a lot of this is required, but it's pretty good advice for people of all levels, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, never in a loan, never get in a bin with it flowing is, is critical. The number one cause of grain entrapment is this reclaim hole plugs up with a chunk of something, corn, whatever, or bean pods. And somebody goes in there with a piece of PVC pipe or a piece of rebar and they stand over it, start poking at it with the envelope equipment running. That's probably 80% of all grain entrapments. I'm sure you've seen the movie Silo not a few years ago. I remember sitting there watching it, and it's a great drama, but and also thinking to myself, man, this whole thing would have been solved with simple lockout, tag out, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. And that old, the, the grandpa that turned it on and engulfed the people, they just left him wandering around. He could have turned it on again. Yeah. They never did show it being locked out, ever. No, it's one of those things. These are tragedies, but they're all preventable tragedies. Definitely. If it's bad enough, you just don't go in. You, uh, you try to get it from outside. There's ways to get the grain out from the outside of the bin, too. You, well, in the commercial industry, they have tunnels from underneath, and they can rod those center sump holes or any sump hole from underneath. Virtually, they don't have tunnels everywhere, and farmers don't generally have any tunnels. If it's a smaller bin, you can use a long pole from the entry door, trying to bust up things. The common sense would tell you not be in the bin if you're trying to break it up. People get into rushes. Uh, last year at Jeeps, I was really excited to see this thing called the Grain Weevil, which is a little robot that will go around. Oh, yeah. I've seen that. I've never seen it. Per, I guess I didn't pay attention. It was a, They had one of those out there? Uh, no, it's not. They're not ready yet. Oh, I saw one. I've seen the pictures of them and how they work, but in the videos. 
Yeah, they they looked really cool. So that's pretty cool. That, that is very neat. Yeah, a lot more fun too to sit there with a remote control grain weevil robot and <laughs> drive it around in the bin. I'm sure. You know, but this year it's shaping up to be a wet corn year, and generally in wet harvest means the next year is a big year for grain entrapments. The grain gets the grain goes out of condition. Yeah, it's about that conditioning, right? And getting it ready. It's harder to do when it's wet. Can we talk a little bit about some of the PPE that you would want to have on you, want to wear while you're getting into a grain bin? On the commercial side, if, if you enter from the top, according to OSHA, if the grain poses an engulfment hazard, you're supposed to wear a lifeline and a harness, and it's supposed to prevent you from sinking further than the waist deep. And that is very difficult to do in 90% of grain bins because they're sloped roof and you enter from the edge of the roof. You know what a grain bin looks like. Where do you tie it to? Where do you hook it to? There are the not passing pulley systems with anchor points in the middle. Anyway, so I think a minimum PPE for going in would be a dust mask. I think you ought to wear a harness every time you go in, whether it's tied to a lifeline or not, because if they had to rescue you, that's something they can hook onto. Boots and a dust mask and a harness. Well, the dust mask is something to think about necessarily. I mean, I've seen a lot of people go in without anything on their faces. And Oh, yeah, and I've, I've, I've done it too. It's... You know, you get molds. There's a lot of molds form in corn and soybeans. They're they're all living organisms and they want to grow. And if they're too wet, molds form in there. And those molds can make you really sick. It's called grain fever. I think the technical name is toxic organic dust syndrome. And it can make you really sick. Moldy corn can make you really sick. Like flu-like symptoms. People, some people get so dehydrated with that, they have to go to the hospital. Oh, wow. I, I never heard of that, but. That makes sense, especially if it's out of condition corn, which is probably why you're in there in the first place, which oftentimes is moldy. <laughs> well, excellent. Um, the chances and chances are, if it's hung up, if there's a pyramid, I call them pyramid in the middle, or a tower, or it's crusted in any way, the odds of it having mold in there are really high. That's what happens: the mold form, and then the little microorganisms start getting in there, eating the mold, and they get they all give off heat. That's when the that mold produces even more, and then you get all, then people get sick. Spores getting their getting their lung. Well, yeah, and then um, well, another reason to have a mask on, right? <laughs> yeah, just definitely. And in, you know, N95 dust mask. Well, if you wear it correctly, which I would guess vast majority of people don't wear them correctly. You know, the strap's got to be not twisted, and the top one's got to be at the crown of your head, and the bottom one's got to be below your ears. If you wear them correctly, they uh, they only filter out 95 percent of the of the dust. That's what they're designed for. That five percent could still get you sick. So. You're better off not going in a moldy bin. Is it crazy that the, the name just finally clicked in my head in 95? <laughs> in 95, yeah, that's what it that's what that means. Yeah, well, hopefully we all well, we all have some practice wearing masks now. So <laughs> yeah, we all yeah, we all do we all wore them wrong all pandemic too. So so John, what kind of training do you do for people? I do mostly commercial. I do uh the OSHA 1910 272 standard. Or that, that covers maintenance, housekeeping, bin entry, contractor safety, drawing a blank now. It's got all the um, hazard monitoring equipment. I, I, I base everything off of that pretty much. And then there's also other OSHA things, you know, lockout, tag out, hazard communication, fall protection, ladder safety. And I try to, I try to hit the big ones that get people, rail car loading safety. Uh, this time of year, I do a lot of pre-harvest, like dump pit, hazards and dump pit. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the hazard monitoring equipment that people should be using? Well, you know, 4B and the two biggest, most common ones I see out there are 4B components. And they're out of Morton, Illinois and uh, CMC, which I'm not sure where they're out of. Well, if you haven't, we're back up for a second. If you have a concrete elevator or inside grain legs, inside a structure, you have to have this hazard monitoring equipment on there. And it's uh, it's motion, meaning that if the if the leg plugs up, it's an there's an RPM reader they put at the bottom. So if the the speed of the leg drops by more than 20% of its normal speed, which means it's starting to plug up, it shuts it off so you don't burn your lagging or drop your grain belt, which is a big loss at harvest time, of course. Or it could cause an explosion. And then there's also rub blocks or touch switches. So if that leg belt comes over and rides to the left or right, it, it bumps into those rub blocks and... The rub blocks, if they heat up, it's a brass block. And if it heats up, if more than, I think it's 100, and, actually, I don't, don't quote me on how many temperature it is, but if it heats up to a certain temperature, it kills the leg before it gets too hot and causes an explosion. And then they also have these little probes that go into the, the bearings and they monitor the speed, the temperature of the bearings. 
And if they get to, a, I believe they're preset at 140 degrees, it uh, shuts the bearing off. The number one cause of uh, green dust explosions is bearings getting hot. And number two is rubs. It prevents two of the biggest hazards if, if they're working correctly. Well, even like the clog and stuff. Because the moment you get a clog, someone's got to go in there and unclog it. So the other kind of the big conditioning one is you, you see a lot of people use rain temperature sensing cables. Oh, yeah. A lot of people have the, what do they call those things? Gosh, I can't remember. I'm going to blank. Yeah, temperature cables. Temperature cables. And they're, you know, they're hooked to the floor and they, and they're, I'd say most people have those, at least the commercial side of things. I doubt farmers do. And they're, uh, they're good. They're really good. Uh, Dr. Dirk Meyer at Purdue, or not at Purdue, he started in Purdue. He's at Iowa State. He, he's big on reading the CO2 levels. Okay? He says that is a much better indicator of, of the condition of how your grain is storing. He does. But he likes temp cables for just certain areas, but for the whole bin, you, the, the CO2 monitoring is better. Because what, you know, that ferment, your grain ferments, it gives off carbon dioxide. And then, you know, if that level's too high, you know, hey, you got to, you got to cool that grain down. Keep it in that condition. Yeah. When they get the grain at harvest, they can't make it better. They, they can dry it, but the general condition of it, it doesn't get any better. The grain elevators and farmers' goal is to maintain it in that, it's in, the, in the condition it came in in until they get ready to send it to market. So you don't, you can't make it better. People think oh, they can make it better. I mean, you can clean it and you can dry it, but as far as the breaking up and the, that kind of stuff, you're not going to make it any better. Yeah. And what's, what's there is there. And it seems like we're going to have pretty very, uh, pretty varied conditions depending on where you are in the country. Cause like you said, it's going to be wet here and then it's been really dry out here and stuff. Sure. The, the perfect bad storm would be a wet harvest and then a market conditions that, that tell them to hold it till like July. That's when you really got a problem. Like the last two years, they've been shipping grain like almost immediately because they, the market needs it. And you don't see near as many engulfments then. I imagine, too, with so much on farm storage now, if there are those conditions that are like, hold it, hold it, hold it. And then you're getting in those bins that are less capable than, you know, commercial operations to really monitor it. And a lot of the farm bins don't have the, the air systems. Uh, you know, they, they might have the knowledge, they, they're, but their bins just don't have the, can't push the air that the commercial bins can. And some of the commercial ones don't either, but, you know, they're, they're more like. Yeah, well, they have, you know, OSHA and other standards that are kind of keeping a little more in line. Um, so uh, this is kind of a question because we do go to the commercial side primarily, but, you know, our customers, their customers are farmers and producers and the people that tend to actually get get hurt in these kind of grain engulfment situations more and more now. Is there anything that a grain elevator, a local co-op or grain elevator, what's kind of the best course of action if they want to try to help or remind their producer customers about grain bin safety? I don't know how I'm going to get it out. That That's give them the advice of, hey, stay out of it. Use a grain vac, you know, hire a mole master or some company that will come and get it out for you just to remind them of the hazards. I mean, very few farmers don't know what can happen. It's just, they don't think it will happen to them. Uh, so what else? Let's see. What, what was your question, original question? I'm sorry. I was rambling. I don't know. I, I rambled quite a bit with it. <laughs> so it's not your. I mean, I think that just remind them of, of the hazards of grain bins. I mean, there's probably, you know, the Purdue has the statistics and I, was it 30, is it 30 to 40 engulfments a year for the last, many, many years, and their, their numbers are probably way low. There's probably at least twice that many that have happened. Well, you think all the ones that happen and never get reported, especially if they happen. Right. And there's a lot of those, a lot of those, because nobody wants that publicity. No, no. I mean, I also, because like you said, everyone knows, right? So it's kind of an embarrassment thing if you're the guy who actually gets, you know, Stuff in his yeah, it is the ones I know. The farmers that survive, they're 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 um, they're embarrassed more, like you, like you said, more than anything at the end of it. They do better, and then, and then they put their their friends and their families and their communities at risk to get them out for something dumb that they did. Well, that's another big thing, right? Because a lot of oftentimes victims are potential rescuers, people who died in after them. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. You know, and then a lot of farms, you know, if it's a, you know, two brothers farm or 
father and son, the, the son's in, the dad goes in to get him, and they're both at the bottom of the bed. You know, uh, the farmers just need, just, just like anybody, the farmers need to not go in the bin that's flowing. You know, if that, if that bin plugs up, don't go in there and poke it with the antelope equipment running, shut it off, and then poke it, and then get out. But, but the problem is they, if they can't find, uh, it's much easier, you know, if you got the plug, if, it, if the equipment's running, because then it starts flowing. But if they, uh, they become part of the grain stream, if it does. Well, and a lot of it's a lack. Well, you see, when you read the stories too, a lot of it's seems to be a lack of communication, not telling people where they are and where they're going. So suddenly like, oh, I haven't seen him in three hours. Oh, he's been in the grain bin. And it's a real tragedy. So. Uh, oh, I, I couldn't even imagine being caught in a grain bin for three, four hours before anybody found me. If I was up to my waist or something, that would be very, very scary. Dirty, dirty, dusty, dark. And there's a lot of pressure on your body. And, and you can you can die just from the pressures on your body. Your blood chemistry gets out of whack. Um, you're la- I've been in some training where I'm trapped for like 10 minutes and my legs are starting to go numb. So I couldn't even imagine what your legs would feel like after that. Yeah, I, I, I can't either. And well, unfortunately, at, at that point, a lot of it becomes a recovery, right? Versus a rescue. Right, right. I was just at that uh, Winnebago Boone County uh, FFA meeting last week and State Line Farm Rescue was there. And uh, they were they, they, they had their equipment there where they could do the practice rescues and they were burying the high school kids. And one of the kids came because so there were stations and, and the state line people came to me and one of the kids came and he was engulfed and he was wearing shorts and you could see his legs, all the indentations of the corn in his legs. And he was with me for about 30 minutes. And by, when he was leaving, they were still there and he was trapped for maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> this is a, this is a 17 year old. We're not talking, you know, older person. Yeah, I, 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 I've become pretty good friends with the uh, people um, at Oklahoma State University that have their grain rescue van. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Carol Jones and the whole, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and she, they keep convincing me, trying to convince me to come down to one of their demonstrations and get in the truck, and I'm like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> so, you should do it. You should do it. It's it's really uh, eye opening. You'll find out if you're claustrophobic real quick. Oh I, yeah, I'm sure it'll bring up a lot of those guys. <laughs> so, um, well, well, uh, thank you so much for talking to me today. I don't think I have any more questions, but it's been really great chat. I think, uh, like I said, it's more about kind of reminding people get the thing, get the word. It, it not necessarily get the word about, but remind people that it needs to be constant, constantly on, on their mind. It needs to be something they're always thinking and talking about. So we always try to devote a lot of time this time of year to kind of brain bin rescue and safety, just because, well, this is the time of year where it kind of all starts. I think the engulfments will start uh, for farms depending on the market, but sometimes in January, but usually about March, March and April, there's a ton of them because they're, they're selling grain for their taxes. So they're, they're trying to get the grain out so they can sell it. And that's when a lot of them happen. They've been, they've been holding it on usually in low quality, right? Really prepped in there and it just gets worse over the winter. Yes. Yes. And it won't, they can't get it out and they get in there and you know, they get out and get in there and rot it and become a victim. Yep. Well, thank you so much. I hope we get to talk again soon, and I, I hope it's a, I hope it's a great harvest season for you. Yeah, sounds good too. Yeah, it's a good time for me. I'm taking vacation, so. Oh, excellent, perfect. Well, enjoy your vacation, and I'll talk soon. Okay, bye. Okay, all right. See you, Steve. All right, bye.